So, here we go. All right, great. Um, so, today's message is the last in our series, As We Wait, which was as we wait for the return of Christ, for his arrival. He, we celebrated his arrival, his first arrival, and we are waiting for his second. He's coming again. I know this is news for some. It doesn't mean we're going to have another Christmas. If he comes again, it's going to be really clear because a lot of people are going to end up somewhere else really quickly. Um, it won't be about Christmas anymore. It'll be about right salvation and eternal life from here on, and, and you'll fi- figure out really quick where you are on that. Is your name in the book of life? Is there hope? Is there still time? And so uh, as we wait for his return, the question we should be asking ourselves is what do we do in the meantime? What are we to be doing right here and now? And the psalmist, this unnamed psalmist for Psalm 146, is going to give us some pretty clear direction on what we should be doing. And, and the bottom line is that we should be praising the Lord. But how we do that is a fair question. How do we praise the Lord? Is it just sing songs? Is it just come to church once a week and, and sing a few songs to Him and check the box? Or is it something that's more like a lifestyle? And, and I think you'll find it's, it's the latter. It's a lifestyle. It is something that we do with our lips. We, we speak praise. We proclaim that and make that public. But it is also something that we do with our hands and our minds and our energies and, and our gifts and our talents and our treasures. So um, what does that look like? How does that work? Um, that's what I think he's going to give us today. Um, as we, here's, here's the message. It's in a nutshell. It's as we wait for his return in uncertain times, let's put our hope in him for all time. Okay? Let's do that. All right? Uncertain times. So I was noticing even the other, uh, even yesterday I was watching, uh, you know, typically when, I, when I'm chilling out at home, sometimes I'll pull up Twitter and see what everybody's yelling about because that's pretty much what happens on Twitter, it seems. And, um, of course, there's another message about uh, the uncertainty of who's going to be our next president. And for some of us, it it seems like it's pretty much decided, like it or not, it seems like it's pretty well decided, and yet there's still this uncertainty, right? It's like, okay, well, the Electoral electoral College has made a selection, but then Congress has to confirm that selection. I didn't know that was a step. And then that's even before there's the inauguration. So it's like, okay, I could kind of make fun of that if I want, but there's still a level of uncertainty. And, and we want to make that a big deal because we're thinking, well, this is a big deal. This is the president of the United States. This is the leader of the free world. This is probably one of the most, if not the most powerful person in the world. This matters. And yet the psalmist will say, don't put your trust in princes. And he's, he's saying princes as in not the current king, but the one to come. Think about it. Why wouldn't he say king there? The one to come. All right. And so don't put your trust in the next president, whichever one it is. Because they're going to, it says, and this isn't prophetic, but this is just truth, 10 out of 10 people die statistically, okay? (laughs) They're going to pass away and they're not going to be able to save you. Neither is the one behind them, him or her. Neither neither was one after that one. We need to be careful that we don't put our hope in a person or in a system or in a government or in, in a nation or in a Supreme Court justice, or in a senator from Georgia. It doesn't matter. Ultimately, that's not whom our hope is in. Our hope is in the Lord. It, that's where it should be. And that's what the psalmist is going to say to us, among other things. So in these uncertain times, what are we left to do? We look to the Lord for help and hope. Okay? Hope is a forward-looking thing. It's faith and confidence, not just in the here and now. I'm trusting right now for something that is coming. That I don't have to worry about the future because I know at the end of the day, he's got me. Okay? And that's hope. And, and you can tell the difference between people who have hope and people who don't because of the way they look at and respond to uncertain times. I'll admit, though, there have been many times in this past year when I have been guilty of wringing my hands and not having hope forgetting the reason for the hope that is in me. Now, our challenge in 2021 as a church is 1 Peter 3.15, and that is always be prepared to give an answer for the reason for, to anyone who asks for the, to give the reason for the hope that is in you. 
the hope that you have. And, and we want to be able to give that reason, and that, we're going to work on that for a whole year so that by the end of the year, everybody who's willing and able is going to be able to do that with confidence, with com- competency, with compassion, with conviction, with courage. Okay? But where does that hope come from? Why should we have that hope? And who are we hoping in? What is it that is so powerful and so hope-giving that I don't even have to, I can just blow off whoever's president when I, and look at the one who created the world in a word. And, they, and the psalmist is going to answer that. So let's roll through this psalm. This is a great psalm. It's got bookends, the beginning and the end. Praise the Lord, which is our application, and it should be an application just how we live. And, and I, I thought this before I read this, okay? I, I, I thought because I like Hebrews 13, verses 15 and 16, because in that passage, it tells us that we should worship the Lord with our lips and our lives. And I just, I like alliteration. It helps me remember things. And verse 15, it talks about praising the Lord with your lips. That's your, your singing out, sacrifice of praise. We've been doing some of that. And then 16, it says, do good things. Okay, that's with your life. Well, it's also in Psalm 146, but I didn't see it at first. And it's right here in verses one and two. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord with all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. You sing through your lips, right? So there it is right there in verse 2. Now in verse 1, he's just saying, praise the Lord. I'm just, he's saying, I'm, I'm doing this. And then he says, I will praise the Lord with all my life. He, what does he say? He's making a vow before God and before all these people who will read this psalm. And he's saying, I will praise the Lord with my lips, with my life. And we'll dive into what that looks like at the very end, application-wise. What what does that look like in my life? But at the end of the day, that's what he's calling us to do. Now he's going to shift from this. He's going to tell us, here's here's some exhortations and and what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to, verse 3, don't put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save, not ultimately. When their spirits depart, Okay, when they die, when they pass, they return to the ground, we bury them, okay? and on that very day, their plans come to nothing. Okay? So it doesn't matter how impressive the person is, they're going to end up, we're all going to end up in the same place, we're all going to end up in the ground unless Jesus comes and takes us home before them. Okay? So he's kind of saying, here's a reason, okay, not to put your trust in that, but to put your trust in the Lord. Now, here comes the main verse. Now, in this psalm, if you, you can kind of read, this happens in Scripture a lot, where you'll have a point made and a verse up here, and then down a ways you'll find another point made that's the same point. And then you'll see the next point mirrored, and the next point mirrored, and then there's a center point. And the reason that the psalmist or the writer, it's not always in the psalms, will, will order Scripture that way a lot of times is because of a couple of reasons. One is they want you to know what's the main idea, what's the thrust of this passage, and it's the point of that chevron, or that chiasm, I think is the biblical word for it. That is, that is the main point, but it's also a way to remember it, okay? So when you're reading the psalm, you're gonna, as you're learning, remember in the days of the writings of, of, the, uh, of the Old Covenant and in the New Covenant, most people didn't have pencil and paper. They weren't writing things down or typing things out. They were having to remember it, and we're thinking, I can't even remember my last name. How in the world am I going to memorize verses and, and ideas and things? And yet that's the whole culture was an oral culture. And so they would write things. Things were oftentimes written in such a way that we would be e- more easily remembering them, understanding them. So what, where's the point of it in this? Is verse 5. The point of this psalm is a blessing. It's a beatitude. And it says this, Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. There's help and there's hope, okay? But they both point to God. Who's the God of Jacob? Who's Jacob? Jacob, remember, son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham, okay? He's the first, the nation of Israel. He is the father of the, of the nation, but the 12 tribes come from Jacob. And, and, and uh, the Lord changed his name to Israel, and that's where we get the name Israel for the nation, because he's one of the patriarchs of the nation of Israel, Okay? So the God of Israel is the God of the Jews, and then as a Christian, I get grafted into that family. I get adopted into that family, because I'm, I'm not Jewish, I'm not part of that, that uh, tribe, that, that nation that God chose to bless the whole world through, but 
because that nation was unfaithful, he said, then I'm going to the Gentiles to make you jealous to come back to me. But at the end of the day, God's goal is to bless the nations, all of them, every tribe, every tongue. And at the throne of God, at the end of times, it will be colorful beyond beauty. It will just be incredibly beautiful, just this beautiful tapestry of, of color, of tribes, of ethnicities, of peoples from all over the world, all praising the same God together in unity and it'll be beautiful, okay? That is the purpose of God choosing a people to bless the people, and it's not because they're better, it's because in some cases, maybe they're the least qualified, and God wanted to bring glory to himself by showing, well, let me show you what I can do with this group of people, and that brings him glory, okay? So the God of Jacob is the one in whom we find our help, and he is the one in whom we put our trust, the Lord, their God. Okay, and this is the Lord God who created it all, which is where he's going to transition to next. He's going to end the psalm by telling us basically two things. The first part, he's going to say, this is who God is, and he's just going to use one verse to do that. And then he's going to tell us how that God is going to be gracious to us, how that God is going to be a blessing to us. Okay, so you really could say, well, blessed are those whose help is from the God of Jacob. What's that blessing look like? He's going to give it that to you in the verses 7 through 10. Okay, so with that, let's just unpack that, and we'll be done. Verse uh, 6 says this. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. So we really draw two obvious things from this passage. One is he's the creator. And and let's, let's, let's be clear. When we say creator, we're talking about a being outside of creation that according to scripture, spoke it into existence. That's the kind of power we're talking about, okay? We're talking about power that makes the Avengers look like tinker toys, okay? We're, we're talking about a power that makes uh, the Eternals, the, the, the most powerful beings that the DC comic, Marvel comic universes combined can create. They're like, they're like little action figures that can't move compared to what God can do, okay? It's not even close, folks. We, it's so big, we cannot comprehend. He's too big. He's too big. This is why there are things that we don't understand about our world, our universe. It's because even those things are too big, and he spoke them into existence from nothing. He didn't have like a supply box, and he's like, okay, I gotta make a universe. Do I have the right pieces here? I gotta figure it out and put it. No, he said, I need a universe, and he got one. I need to fill it, and he filled it. And eventually he got to earth, right? And, and, and we look out amongst the stars and we see, you know, hundreds of billions of, of stars inside our galaxy, which is one of hundreds of billions of galaxies that make up our universe. And God's got, yeah, all of that is for you. So that you can look out and say, well, why, God, did you make something so big for little old us? And, and God wants to go, so that you can begin to understand how big I am and how small you are and how much I love you anyway. That's massive. That should break, start to break the ice that, that, sh- that causes us to not worship him. That should warm and begin to thaw our cold, hard hearts of, wor- of lacking worship in our, with our lips and our lives. It should begin to thaw us Okay, I don't know what your reasons are for not really wanting to worship the Lord, but let me just tell you, God's not usually impressed with our worship, okay? And I'm talking to my church right now for just a second, so you guys can hold on for just a second, right? He's not always impressed with our worship, okay? He's not always impressed with my worship. He probably isn't ever impressed with my worship, okay? Why? Because my heart is cold towards him compared to what it should be. Maybe it's lukewarm at best, compared to what it should be, okay? And, and I think we probably all struggle with that. And the reason we struggle with that is because we don't know who, what he's like, we don't know him personally, or we don't invest in that relationship to the extent at which we should so that we are responding to him in a way that is worthy for what he deserves. And this is why the psalmist, among other reasons, says, let me give you the two things that describe this amazing God. He created you from scratch using nothing but words, and he's faithful. He's, it's another way of saying he's good and able. 
All right, we open, I, we t- one of the first blessings we taught our kids, and maybe the only one we taught them at the dinner table, God is great, God is good is how it starts, right? Those are some really good theological truths. God is great, omnipotent, all-powerful, can do anything. He is able, so I don't know what you're going through and struggling with. He is able to deliver, okay? And he is good. He is good. He wants to deliver. He wants to set you free. He wants to thaw your heart towards God and people. He's faithful. God is able. He is good and able. So, so from here now, what does that look like? Some of us are going to find ourselves in these words, and some of us need to find ourselves in these words. Some of us are going to read this and go, oh, this is good news for me. I really need this. And some of us are going to go, I don't get it. And you need to. Because you're blessed because you're not looking at these words going, oh, this is such good news for me. If you're not having to say that, then you're the one who needs to be the answer for the one who needs to say, who is saying, oh, this is good news for me. Where's it going to come from? It's going to come from God's people. We're going to talk about oppressed people in just a second. And this is what I want you to hear, among other things. There are those who are oppressed. There are those who are oppressing them. And then there's the rest of the people. Okay? Some of you can identify with being oppressed. Maybe you felt that way. Maybe you are right now being that. Some of you know what it's like to be the oppressor. Maybe you are not aware of it yet. Maybe you have been. Maybe you're both because you can be being oppressed and then turn around and do it to others because it's being done to you. And then there's those who aren't either in any of those camps and have the potential to be part of the solution that cures the world and saves the person from that. God will do that through you. It's not that we're the Savior, but it's that God chooses to save through people. He showed that to us in his Son. So let's walk through these last verses, and let me show you what I mean. So I'm going to read verse 6 again. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. Now, how is he going to remain faithful? How is he going to show his glory? Here's how he's going to do it. Here's how he does it. In the past, he's done it this way, he's doing it this way, and he's going to continue to do it because he doesn't change. He upholds the cause of the oppressed. That's just one way of saying it. Uh, What Dee read, I can't remember how she read it, but it was another beautiful way of saying, God cares for people who are oppressed. He hears their cry, and he responds. And you say, well, he's not responding in my life. I'm still crying out. Well, his timing is perfect. Easy for me to say, I'm not the one struggling through it, what you're struggling through right now. But God is faithful. The question is, do you believe him? Do you trust him? Are you resting in his faithfulness? Are you holding hope for his help in your future, whether it's tomorrow or a longer time away? He upholds the cause of the oppressed. He gives food to the hungry. This seems pretty straightforward, right? And yet we have hungry people in our world. So does that mean that God's not working? I say no. I don't think so at all. I think he is working. Imagine how many hungry people we would have if he wasn't working. And yet we have hungry people in our nation, maybe the most wealthiest nation in the world, maybe in history, I don't know, but we shouldn't have that, right? And, and, and all of these, it's like, oh, this is good news. I can look to God for help in my oppression. I can look to help God for help in my hunger. Most of us can't relate to that. Most of us, if we don't get a snack between lunch and dinner, we feel like we're in the hungry crowd. Some of us are so consumed with food that if it doesn't look right, we won't eat it. And then others are like, I'll eat anything. Uh, I I read the book uh, Under the Overpass years ago, and it's about these two college students that went and became homeless on purpose to experience homelessness And they went six months, and they traveled to five different cities, and they told their story in this book. And they would have told you at the beginning, there's no way they're eating food out of a trash can. But they had by the time they'd been through that. Because homelessness crushes you, your spirit is crushed, and you'll do almost anything to get something in your stomach. You'll you'll sit at an outside cafe and wait for somebody to put their leftovers in the trash so that you can time it so you can get it right off the top. Or maybe even be bold and ask them for it as they walk to the trash can. You will find ways, right? And we can't, most of us, we can't relate to that. 
This is why it's in here. Because people are hungry in our world. Who's going to feed them? Who's going to feed them? You say, well, they're just not taking care of their own business. They're not, they're not being disciplined with their money. They're not getting a job. You know what? It doesn't say feed the hungry that are doing it right. It doesn't say feed the hungry um, who have everything else all together. Are you, you thinking hunger is going to be on the list? of one? Of, I'm going I'm to stay hungry so I can keep this part of my life ordered. No. This is the most basic of basic needs, right? Shelter, food, water, clothing, basics here, folks. And yet we have kids going to schools and they're having to get lunch given to them and we're giving them backpacks to carry them over the weekend because their families aren't taking care of them like they could. You say, well, that's, that's because their parents aren't being good parents. Okay, should that change what we do about it? No. They shouldn't. So you see, some of us are hearing these words and we're like, yes, I need freedom from oppression. Yes, I need my hunger satisfied. And some of us are going, well, I don't get that, so I guess this isn't for me. Absolutely, this is for us. Because this is how God shows his glory. Through people who say, either I need to be rescued or I'm going in to rescue someone else. Okay, And it's not just food. It's not just physical food. Okay, The Bible says that this is food. And I keep hearing this from people who keep visiting here. They're like, we can't find a church that's preaching the word. Now, I have trouble believing that in the holy city. But they keep saying it. So I'm like, okay, we have one thing, one word. It feeds our soul. It fuels our faith. This is where we need to be. And, and it's not all on the preacher, guys. Okay? We get you one day a week. And that needs to change too, by the way. Okay? And that's going to change here in 21 also. But you're responsible for feeding yourself ultimately, right? Nobody raises their kids, and as a teenager, the kid's still in the high chair. Okay? I mean, that's just a gross sight, right? A teenager in a high chair with a bottle going, More! You know, that just, that's just gross, right? And yet, spiritually, that's what we have in our churches all over the city. People who are not feeding themselves the word of God. They're not Monday through Saturday opening it up and going, what do you have to say to me today, Lord? It's not read, it's not read to check a box, but I'd rather you read and check a box than not read at all. That's how you learn the discipline, is you discipline yourself to follow and do that. And then, of course, then as you do that, then one day God surprises you and he, and, he, and he goes, boo, I've got a word for you. That rhymed. I didn't mean for that too. But you know what I'm saying? He's like, I want to speak to you and you're finally giving me a place to where I can hear, you can hear me. And so he, he's speaking. So um, when he's saying these things, he is speaking to physical needs. But he's also speaking to spiritual needs. And there's, there's things in between. There's mental and emotional, and all those things matter. And, and I don't have time to unpack these into gory detail. My point is this. You, some of us need to hear this as good news because we're, we're looking for this. And some of us need to get on the backside of this and say, I'm going to be the mailman and deliver the goodness that God is sending. And we can do that and be a part of the, and get some of the glory, uh, not the glory, the joy of that. Or we can stand on the sidelines and let somebody else have that. But that's on us. Amen. He's going to do it. He's going to do it. So he upholds the cause of the oppressed. He gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. I want you to picture yourself. Uh, this may be hard because most of us don't know what it's like to be um, in the military. And even if you do, many of them don't know what it's like to be behind enemy lines. And even if you do, most of them have not been in a POW camp. But if you know what that's like, and maybe you've read a book about it and you know a little bit. I want you to imagine, it's, uh, let's just say it's Vietnam. You're in the jungles of North Vietnam. You've been captured. You're in a bamboo shack that's so secure that they don't even put anything on your wrist. They just throw you in there and then they lock it. And that's where you spend day after day after day. And when, you, when, you, when they come and bring you something or ask you questions and you don't give them the answer they want, they beat you with the canes. They beat you with bamboo. And they hit you in the head. And they keep hitting you in the head because that, that's where it hurt. And, and one day you just don't say the right things and it's, you just hit the wrong guy. And he beats you to a pulp. And your eyes are so swollen that they swell shut. You can't see light, much less anything. And they throw you back in there. 
And because you can't see, they throw you back in there, they slam the door, and it, and they, and it bangs back open, and they don't see it. And it's open, unlocked. You're in the shack. All you have to do is get up and walk out, but you don't. You know why? Because you can't see. Amen. You are free, but not really because you can't see what's right in front of you, because your eyes are swelled shut. For some of us, our eyes have been swelled shut from the injustice and the pounding that we've received in life. For some of us, it's an unwillingness to let God open our eyes. I don't know what, it could be a hundred ways we could unpack that. The point is this, God says that he gives sight to the blind. He gives sight to the physically blind, he can heal miraculously, we've seen that in scripture. Uh, He heals spiritual blindness, which is sometimes a hard, it's so hard we're unwilling to even look at him. We're unwilling to even trust this. We come at this book with such skepticism, it's like, it's like walking up to the door and closing our eyes and going, I can't see any way out of here. I don't see any way out of here at all. How do I get out of here? I don't, I can't, there's no way out of here. There's no escape. And we won't even open our eyes. Sometimes that's on us. Because God's grace and mercy There's no lack of that. There's no lack. I think it would be really hard to be a skeptic today. It would be really painful. I feel for folks that struggle with that belief thing. But I want you to know something. If 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 that's you, God gives faith as a gift. For you've been saved by grace through faith. And this not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not the result of works so that no one can boast or brag about it. God makes it so that you can't take any credit for the faith that you have. Amen. God gives you that. It is a gift of grace means it's unmerited favor, God's riches at Christ's expense, and we receive that or we don't. I've used this example many times. It's appropriate this time of year. There's a package under the tree. It's got your name on the tag, but it's not yours until you open it. And you might not open it. You might go, well, it's not really mine. Somebody just put my name on it. That might be one reason you're not opening your gift, okay? It might be that you're so proud, you're like, I don't need that gift. I don't know what your reason is. You know what your reason is, maybe. Maybe you don't. It doesn't matter. The, the fact is, you're preventing God's grace in your life when, you are, when you're not trusting him. When you stiff arm God like a football player going down the street. You've seen Derrick Henry stiff arm these people lately? My goodness, the guy's a beast. He's taking kids, he's just, they're like kids, and he just throws them out of the way and keeps running down the field. We do that spiritually when we stiff arm God. God is coming at us with arms open wide like the father on the front porch, waiting for the prodigal son. He's, he's coming, he's preparing his speech. Oh, Father, I've sinned against you. I don't deserve to be your son anymore. Just let me be a servant in your household. And the father hears the speech and he just gives him this big bear hug and he says, bring the fattened calf, let's have a party. Bring the jeweled ring, bring the sandals and the robe of honor so that I can surround my son with the grace that he doesn't deserve. That's what God's waiting to do. Why are you being so skeptical? Why are you pushing God back away when he's trying to come to you? He's not going to force his way. He's a gentleman. But he's not giving up either. He's persistent. And I love how God did that. When Adam and Eve sin and they go and they run hide, what does God do? He goes after them. Because they don't even know they need rescue. God rescues them. And he's coming after us too. And some of us are enjoying that, that grace We're not even really doing a great job with it. We kind of treat it cheaply sometimes, but it's still God's grace, and we can change and we can grow. But some of you are stiff-arming God. Some of you are so skeptical, and there's not even a good reason for it. It's just pride. You're just so proud. It's just lay it down. Look what he says about pride. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. When you get on your knees before somebody else, and we never do this in America because we're Americans, right? We're proud to be an American. When you do this in front of someone else and you're not mocking them, you're showing that person, I am lower than you because I want to honor you, okay? Now, we do it in different ways in our culture sometimes, but at the end of the day, getting down in the dirt is nobody wants to get down in the dirt, right? Nobody wants to clean floors and baseboards. Nobody wants to mop with, the, with a sponge. We want to be up here doing all of that. We want to be farther away from that because that's dirty. That's unclean. And he says, 
What does he say? He says, he says, the Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. He takes the hand and he lifts that person. Makes me think of Cinderella when she's down on the ground with that glass slipper slipped on her and she's lifted up by the prince. What a picture. What a picture. She's nobody and he makes her somebody. That's what God does. He takes enemies of God and he and he brings them into his family and they become royalty, princes and princesses. And I'm not talking Disney either. I'm talking way better, okay? And okay, it, those are good, but they're just a smidgen of a shadow of what the real thing's like. Forever. Um, he says in James 4, 8 and a couple of other places, God exalts, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. One of the reasons we don't have more followers of Christ in America is because we're so proud. And it's not just an American thing. I've been to other countries. I've seen pride in other countries. And, and I'm going, you don't really have a whole lot of reason to be proud. Neither do I. Not when it comes down to what I could have if I would humble myself and allow God to be Lord of my life. I mean, like, really let him be Lord of my life. Like, surrender my life to him. Give him my agenda. Give him my dreams. Give him my stuff. Give him everything. Give him the most precious people in my life. Surrender it all to him. We do childhood dedications here from time to time. We did one just a few weeks ago. Maybe last week. And um, the, the parents come up. With their, their, sometimes their child, sometimes their baby, and they, and they dedicate that child to the Lord. They're basically saying, we're giving him back to you. We trust you with him, Lord. We're not going to ultimately tell him or her what to do. Ultimately, we want you to do that, and we're going to encourage that. And then we go live our lives as if that didn't ever happen. That's the difference between professing your faith and living your faith. We actually live the faith we really have. You realize that, right? So when there's a gap between what we say we believe and what we actually do, this is reality about how we're living. Now, folks, I'm down here with you, okay? I am not pointing the finger. I'm like, Lord, help us. Have mercy on us, okay? And, and yet I say that knowing he will not disappoint us. He is faithful. He is so faithful. So, and it ends up with this. The Lord watches over the foreigner, okay? This is not a political statement, but another word for foreigner is sojourner, pilgrim, immigrant. See, the blood pressure went up as soon as I said the last word. The others don't mean anything because they're Bible words, so we just kind of throw them aside because they're irrelevant. Immigrant sounds pretty relevant, doesn't it? It doesn't say legal or illegal, I'm not for illegal immigration. I'm not for tearing down walls and letting everybody in. This is not about that. This is about who's here now and where am I right now and what am I going to do about it, okay? Look, Jesus was an immigrant, okay? Immigrants are people too, legal or not. And as a follower of Christ, I have a responsibility sometimes to do something about that. And you're like, Darren, you're overwhelming me. There's too much here. You're right. There is too much for any one of us. But there's not too much for our God plus all of us. Okay? And this, if this will help, I love Andy Stanley's way of saying this. He says, do for one what you would like to do for all. Instead of saying, it's too much. I just throw up my hands and do nothing. That's a cop out. Don't be a coward. Say, God, I will do for one what I would like to do for more than one. And if you grace me in that, maybe I'll do it for a second. Maybe I won't. But I'm going to do it for one. And I can't do all of this, Lord. I'll start where you can. He's like, prison ministry freaks me out. I can't go there. But I can help an orphan. Okay, start there. But what God will do is he will impact your life in such a way by showing you his provision and his faithfulness and his courage. And you're going to go in and you're going to, do, you're going to see God work. And you're going to be like, well, clearly I didn't do that. That changed that kid's life. And all I did was read them a book so that they got a little better at reading. Okay? It's a step in the right direction. That's what we mean by worshiping with your life and not just through a song or two on Sunday morning. You know what I think sometimes God says to us? And I, see that, I say this because I've seen this in him say it to Israel. I hate your worship services. Because you come in here and you say all these good things and then you don't go out and live that. You just say it. You just, you just talk. And the world's looking at us going, 
what's the big deal about church? What, well, those, those people don't do any more than anybody else. Now, I don't believe that's true. I don't believe that's true at all. I don't believe that's true comprehensively. I think there's a lot of examples we can point to. The reason there's grace and mercy in our world is because of the church, okay? I believe the church is the hope of the world because the church centered on Christ is the hope of the world. But I know that we as churches struggle in doing this kind of thing. We are pretty self-absorbed in America, and the church is not exempt from that, okay? I, I think that's true, and, and I, can, I see some of the back side of church ministry enough to know that that's, that's not uncommon, okay? And I've been part of that, and I'm, you know, I, I want to change too. I want God to do that work in my heart so that he'll see it in my life, and that's just mercy. I need God's mercy. When it comes to the immigrants, I, like, how do we help an immigrant, right? Well, all I would say is this. Don't be afraid of people who are different than you. Start there. Befriend people because they're people made in the image of God, not because they're not, not because they're like you or not even because they're not like you, but be willing to go there because we're all people, okay? We're in different wrappers, okay, whatever. I mean, if I checked, last time I checked, I ate every M&M in the box. It didn't matter what color it was. I like my M&Ms, right? Well, it, right, let's just treat people that way. I'll take care of a lot of this other. You don't have to start a nonprofit. Just go love people who aren't like you and people who are like you. And, and our differences aren't just based on color. Our differences are based on socioeconomic status, uh, ideologies, um, belief systems, religions. There's all kinds of diversity in our world and in our nation. Okay, let's embrace it. That takes courage. That's hard. I get it. I struggle too. Let's end this up. And he sustains the fatherless and the widow. God sustains. That word sustains, whenever you see creator in scripture, you need to realize that God not only started it, he keeps it going, and one day he's gonna end it. Okay, the Bible talks about a new heaven and a new earth. That means the old ones are gonna be toast, literally. He's gonna burn them up, and he's gonna start with new, okay? Eternal, my eternal, my eternal state, whatever that is, whenever that happens, Will, cut, will take me through the fire. My faith cannot be burned. It can only be purified, okay? That's what I'm talking about, okay? So not everybody makes it through the fire. You need Jesus to make it through the fire, okay? Think back, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the king looks in, he says, wait a minute, didn't we throw three guys in there? There's four, and one looks like an angel. It was Jesus in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And it says when they came out, they didn't come out smoking but unharmed, okay? They were like, like there's not like smoke rising off their clothes. They said they didn't even smell smoke on their clothing. They were untouched by the flame. And I guarantee you their faith was purified in that moment. Talk about, wow, God. And that's what he's going to do for us, okay? And there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth and a new city, and it's going to have a garden, but there's going to be a city too, and it's going to be glorious. It's going to be glorious. He sustains the fatherless and the widow. The fatherless are the orphans in our world when, and the widows. I think he ends here because these are the, some of the most vulnerable in our culture. If you want somewhere to start in our culture, start where the most vulnerable people in their culture are. Okay? Okay. Um, and it's not as bad in America as it was back in those days. And in a lot of parts of our world, it's still this way. Women have very little power to take care of themselves. If it's up to them, they, ha they have a really hard time scratching out a living. And the older they get, the harder that is. Okay, so an elderly woman is extremely vulnerable in our culture, in, in most cultures, in all cultures. A young child is extremely vulnerable, right? What can a two-year-old do for themselves? Nothing. Really can't do much of anything for themselves. Go one-year-old, what can they do? Even less. You know, so what are we to do about that? What does he say? What does he want us to do? He says, let's go back. Blessed are those whose help is from God, the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. And where does God send that help from? From the people who praise his name, and believe that they praise him with their lips and their lives. And how does that happen? And, and Hebrews 13 unpacks that for us. But and, and he sends us in to do these things. What's the most vulnerable person and people on the planet? 
even more vulnerable than an elderly widow who has no family to support her at all and no parent to take care of that child. The most vulnerable on the planet is the unborn. They're literally being carried around by somebody else who, has, who makes every single decision for them. What they put into their body, they have to, they, they absorb it, good or bad. And whatever they decide to do with this before or after birth, they're vulnerable to, they are totally without choice. You want to talk about giving women choice? How about the woman here? Let's give her choice, okay? But it's not about political. It's not the political piece. It's bigger than that, okay? It's, here's a person that is vulnerable, and our job is to go to those who are oppressed and vulnerable and need somebody to rescue them. Our spiritual condition before God is just as vulnerable as this baby in the womb, okay? So this is... The, the whole political thing has made this argument harder to make because God loves people before and after they're born, okay? We saw the Christmas story, and the Bible says that the Holy Spirit went into John the Baptist while he's in the womb. The Holy Spirit doesn't inhabit tissue. The Holy Spirit inhabits people, indwells people. So don't you think we should treat them as people? Okay, so I'm not saying go start another nonprofit. Okay, please hear me. I'm saying let's love all people and let's do what we can do to make that change. Okay, and it might be a conversation you're having with a young girl who's carrying a baby that's questioning what they should do about that. Don't wag your finger in her face and tell her when she's going to hell. Don't do that. Love her and help her and give her hope. That's what we're talking about. And, and folks, this room's full of people that know how to do that. You guys know how to give people help and hope. You guys know how to do that and give people help and hope. I'm just saying, let's do that. Let's not be so self-absorbed in our, our lives that we don't have any time or energy for anyone else. That's what this is saying. That's what we say when we're saying, praise the Lord with your lips and your lives. Lord reigns forever, okay? Just to remind you, God is eternal, <laughs> all right? And he reigns, that means he's sovereign, he's king. You, God, O oh Zion, for all generations forever. Praise the Lord. And let's end on Hebrews 13. Okay, this is, go to near the end of your Bible. After most of Paul's letters, you'll find the, the letter of, of Hebrews, chapter 13, which is the last chapter there, verses 15 and 16. This goes back to worship the Lord with your lips and your lives. This is where I got it the first time before I saw it in 146. All right. We don't know who wrote Hebrews, but he's writing to believers, especially Jewish Christians, but all Christians. They're through Jesus, therefore, so don't forget that, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. And then he specifies what that looks like. The fruit of lips that openly profess his name. So, so he defines a sacrifice of praise. First of all, the word sacrifice means it's costly. It means if your worship of God today didn't cost you something, then it was no sacrifice, which means it was praise, but it wasn't a sacrifice of praise. He's calling us to a sacrifice of praise. Now, for some of you, you say, well, I, I, I sacrificed time to be here, okay? I sacrificed a little bit of gas money to get here, okay? All right, some of you sacrificed suffering to get here. Some of you, it would have been more comfortable physically to stay home, and you pushed through the pain, and you came. That's, a, that's what I'm talking about. Now we're starting to, oh, now I'm starting to feel sacrifice, okay? Because most of us can afford a half a tank of gas to get here. Most of us can afford the time. We weren't going to do anything else this morning except sleep in anyway, right? But now we're starting to say, okay, that cost me. Sacrifice of praise. The fruit of lips, that means it's something you're speaking to openly, that's public, Profess his name, Jesus-centered, okay? We have a personal faith. We do not have a private faith. Christian faith is an oxymoron. Amen. Private Christian faith is an oxymoron, okay? All right, our faith is a public faith. It's a personal faith, but it is not meant to be kept to yourself. That's diametrically opposed to what Jesus discipled his disciples to do. Then the second verse is this. Uh, verse 16 says this. Um, and do not forget to do good, and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Do not 
forget to do good and to share with others. That's basically describing verses 7 through 9 in the psalm. We need to help the oppressed, set prisoners free, help the blind see, feed the hungry, take care of orphans and widows and immigrants. You see what I'm saying? See where I'm going? All of these are people who are vulnerable and need Jesus and they need, the, they need to see Jesus. And how are they going to see Jesus? Through the hands and feet of his people, the body of Christ. That's the tangible of Jesus that this world has now. Jesus is sitting by, by God, working through the spirit of Jesus in our hearts, fleshing it out through the hands and feet of those who are willingly, gladly submitted to his reign and seeing it um, be um, exemplified in our world until he comes to finish setting it up completely. That's our job. And we do it and we worship him through our lips and through our lives. Let's pray. Lord God, um, it is is so much easier to preach this than to do it. I confess that I have not done this well. I resolve to change that. And I I believe all over this room there are people that are you you're tapping them on the shoulder and you're going. I need you to hear this, whatever that was. It may not have even been something I said. But Lord, we all need a word from you. Even when that word's painful conviction. God, pray for the skeptic in the room right now. The skeptic online watching right now. I pray for that person that you would give them the faith to believe and the courage to step in that direction. To step towards you instead of away. To to relax that arm that wants to keep you at arm's length and to bend the elbow and allow you to hug them with your grace and mercy today. Wrap your arms around them. Help them believe that you're real. And receive and believe, repenting of their doing life on their own terms, in their own way, with their own agenda. That has not worked out so well. Maybe it looks good on the outside, but inside, you know how you feel. And Lord, there are people in the room that are believers of yours and are struggling. They're they're feeling a lot of the effects of what we've described today. They feel like the safest place right now is jail. Life is so hard. God, I pray they would put their eyes on you, that they would find their help and their hope in Jesus. Lord, I pray that this church would be known not for anything that is just surfacy, but only for the things that matter. The love, a sacrificial praise that exemplifies itself through works of of service and mercy and compassion for the least and the most vulnerable in our city, for the least and the last and the lost of our world, around the corner and around the world, that we would be known for that, not because we need the notoriety, but simply because we're doing it. And God, it's just so easy to just sit back and do church and be comfortable. It's just so easy to do that and to miss the real riches of living in the life that you call us to live. So change us from the inside out, God. Turn us inside out if necessary. If our hearts are hard, crush our hearts so that you might be able to drop the seed of the gospel in there and that it might have some hope of sprouting and bearing fruit that will last. Rescue us so that we might rescue others, that we might order our lives around your agenda and none other. In Christ's name we pray.